Welcome to our webcast, where we just hacked applying digital forensic techniques for your industrial control systems. I'm your moderator, Peter Wielander, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Control Engineering. I'm now happy to introduce today's distinguished speakers. Matthew E. Llewellyn is a co-founder of Drago Security, LLC, a cybersecurity company that develops tools and research to enable the industrial control system community. Matthew is also co-founder of Cybody, providing control system and cybersecurity hands-on training kits and instructor-led education. He is also adjunct faculty at DePaul University and a SANS Institute and Cisco Systems Certified Instructor. Prior to incorporating Cybody and Drago Security, Mr. Llewellyn was co-founder of Encari, a NERC SIP cybersecurity consulting firm. Mr. Llewellyn also served as an information security network engineer and an architect at Argonne National Laboratory. Robert M. Lee is a co-founder of Drago Security, LLC, a cybersecurity company that develops tools and research to enable the industrial control system community. He is also an active duty U.S. Air Force Cyberspace Operations Officer. Robert received his bachelor's degree from the United States Air Force Academy and his master's in cybersecurity, digital forensics from Utica College, where he now teaches as an adjunct lecturer. He is the author of SCADA and Me, and is currently pursuing his PhD at King's College London with research and control system cybersecurity. I'm Peter Wielander, webcast moderator and a content manager for control engineering. Please take a moment to remind yourself about dealing with technical issues during the presentation. And now, Matt and Robert, take it away. All right, hello and welcome to Where We Just Hacked, Applying Digital Forensic Techniques for Your Industrial Control Systems. I'm Matt Llewellyn and also with us is Rob Lee. And definitely excited to be able to provide this webinar for everybody. Uh, hopefully you've had the opportunity through Control Engineering Magazine or through the online article to have already seen our earlier piece that came out uh, around digital for forensic capabilities within industrial control systems because this is absolutely a follow-on to that. Uh, excitedly, uh, there's over 300 people that have registered for uh, this initial webcast. And with that, that initial registration, a number of you came back and gave us some fantastic questions. In fact, I've personally never seen the number of questions that have come into this level and this level of sophistication. So we're really excited to help address some of those questions uh, through this 20 to 30 minute webinar. Of course, we can't cover them all, but we're gonna do the best that we can. That said, beginning the process of, you know, where are you just hacked is trying to figure out, can you even identify how you were compromised? Can you understand, you know, what, what was your initial indication that something has happened? Was it the fact that, you know, maybe antivirus was finally successful really in detecting something in, in an environment. Uh, possibly it was that you saw some kind of strange network communication occurring. Maybe it was the fact that an operator identified that maybe within your operations some kind of a, a sensed environment you know, or variable is not showing truly what's being represented out in the field. Maybe it's the fact that you've had applications crashing or possibly even you've noticed do you believe there's been some kind of emails that you're receiving that look like it's some kind of a sophisticated social engineering technique where somebody is trying to figure out who you are and what you are and what you have access to and you're really concerned about what you're receiving? There's a number of early indicators that can really help you understand what's in your environment. And ultimately now it's, well, what do you do next? And um, I would like to pass over to Rob for a little bit to, to try to help us with that, uh, that type of scenario and what we should do. Thanks, Matt. So what I would say is when you're looking to identify a compromise, one of the basic things you have to have, and I, and I know, Matt, you and I agree pretty steadfastly on this, you have to understand your network. You have to know what it looks like. If you want any chance of identifying the compromises, you need to know what you're looking at. And one of the things that I think is very powerful is once you do understand your network, you know what looks weird. You know what is abnormal use of your network. And that's a very powerful tool. Actually, I would argue uh, that that is the most powerful tool that you have in your defense repertoire, is just to be able to have a complete understanding of your network. But that's hard. 
some facility is it's just not possible for most people. You're talking about hundreds or thousands of nodes, whether it be from the you know business operations or field networks up to your your corporate networks. It just doesn't work sometimes. So in that case, what I would say is realize that the capabilities of hackers usually get made out in the media and elsewhere to be extremely advanced. But what we honestly see a lot of times is these hacker groups or even uh, nation state styled groups have to learn and understand your facility to do anything decent in it. So realize that about hackers and about these groups, that they need to know your networks to be effective, especially with control system type networks. So they're going to be looking for things to understand and learn your network. So if you don't understand your network fully, but you know where certain things are kept, like configuration files and log files and network architecture diagrams, you know those things exist on your network, those are great places to look and see, hey, you know, an attacker's going to have to come after these. Maybe I should set up some small amount of sensing around this. Maybe I should look at the network traffic around this area. Have they been modified or accessed recently? Um, or if you are a really sort of forward-leaning network and you do have network monitoring capabilities, uh, you know, put up a, a simple intrusion detection uh, system type signature that says, if I see configuration files and network maps and these, these type of files leaving my network, let me know about that. And so I, I would say that's one of the easiest things you can do to quickly identify a compromise. Um, we have on there, you know, the capabilities of hackers and, and attack scenarios. And the thing I try to get through to people most is, again, hackers are not always these sophisticated tier one, you know, amazing actors. A lot of times, they're just trying to figure out as they go along. And sometimes it works for these guys and gals. So don't be intimidated. Take the position that you're the defender of your network, you're, you're the owner of your network, and that's a very powerful position to be in. Some of these groups and actors that we see actually weren't even control system hackers or control system uh, engineers to begin with. A lot of them were IT hackers or people that were really good at you know, just compromising Windows systems, that now they've got team management and metrics and a, and a boss to look up to and have to work for. And so they switched over to these high value targets of uh, industrial control systems. You, you actually see quite a bit of that in the patterns of these hackers, that they go by the standard sort of tool set. Send a phishing email, get information back. Scan the networks to try to identify some sort of reconnaissance, then try to exploit the networks. Leverage privileges move through your network, learn your network, and then try to have some sort of effect. These are all standard styles of attack vectors that can quickly be identified when you do understand your network. So with that, Matt, I would uh, pass it back to you. You know, if you get to the point where you truly feel that your system's been compromised and, and you're trying to figure out how to see how compromised you really are, right? So what's, you know, whether the, the sophistication of the attacker may be that you know, maybe this has been going on for months. You know, you've just finally just become aware of this, and this has been something where the environment has been compromised for, you know, almost a year. And, in fact, through, you know, the ICS cert, that was you know, a number of compromisations actually indicated that the time from a system being compromised to actually being identified was around a year, and if that's the case, it really isn't necessarily in your best interest as the asset owner and operator to make an immediate response, especially if that response ends up tipping off whomever has compromised your environment, and also realize that whatever your indication is, it may really be a false indicator. You may be seeing something that just is a misconfiguration in an environment, not necessarily an indication that the, that the environment has been compromised. And that really is all about how sophisticated is your instant response plan. How many times have you dealt with responding to these types of, of threats? It's a, it's a real challenge, absolutely. Uh, and hopefully you already have some kind of capability organization that includes an instant response plan. That includes working with the right people. And we're going to talk to this in just a moment. But I want to make certain that you, you just don't make that active response immediately. And I'll, I'll tell you firsthand, back in 1998, the very first system that I saw was compromised. It, wasn't at a, it was not at an industrial facility. Uh, it was when I was back uh, working in the national labs, <clears throat> and it was a Red Hat system. I remember this very, very succinctly, very specifically. 
and we monitored it for a while. We had the ability to set up network taps. We were able to see what was going on. Of course, the attacker did not know that we were able to see them. And then we saw them gain, starting to gain access to uh, some specific set of sensitive information that really they probably shouldn't have had access to. And uh, at that point in time, we, we pulled the plug, right? We actually pulled the network cable. And holy cow, at that point, you, know, you pull the cable, guess what had happened? The system actually started erasing itself. And very easily, you can then, by your response, start making the situation much worse. Uh, you really, you know, whatever your initial indicator is, whether, again, as I was saying before, if it's a firewall rule being hit or somebody just having some kind of a spear phishing campaign against them or you believe you see out in the field systems being manipulated in ways that really it shouldn't be happening within your operations. All of those are different levels of sophistication of an attacker and you really want to try to act in concert and have the right personnel involved in the process. So that leads to your assumptions. And as we go to the next slide here, we're talking about just some things that you need to assume in your environment. In the very beginning, if you truly believe that you've been compromised, you have to assume that all your communications are being eavesdropped upon at that time and that any of your assets can be denied service or misused. And that's a really scary assumption to have. Uh, I mean, imagine your plant communications being compromised or your email system being compromised. I mean, you had this early indicator that something's happened. You have to assume that they've essentially taken over the whole environment and then start identifying how trustworthy everything is. And we'll get to that in just a moment, but I'd love to hand it back over to Rob so he can give us some basis or understanding of, of things we can do or, or some assumptions we should understand. Absolutely. So uh, I think the point you raised about getting to that trustworthiness is great. I know that this is going to come up in a couple of slides, but I would say for this, when you're trying to assume by communications and capabilities, you really need to validate each system you use for that and say, look, um, these two computers are 100% clean. I can talk together. Or, you know, it comes down to it, do the old, old speaker net type thing where you, you take a pen and paper and you communicate that way for a while. It sounds arcane, but in a sensitive control system environment, it's not worth taking the risk. Anybody who's ever played around with even the basic kind of hacking tools with Metasploit and Backtrack or Kali or, or, or any type of basic tools, there's auto scripts and auto capabilities for just pushing a button and getting a keylogger. And you're already on a system and you can just enable keylogging to say, look, anything they type, put in a text file and send it back to me. That's kind of scary on these type of environments. There's no reason to be overly paranoid, right? We don't want to push a bunch of hype here. There are real threats, but you are in a position of power. You are those network defenders. So don't rush it. I think that's such a good point to bring up with digital forensics in terms of being in a compromise where you don't immediately throw all the alarms, right? You want to have that, that level of trust with your management, with your own leadership, that when you come to them with an issue, it's absolutely a real issue. And they know and trust you that you've run down all other false positives and, and all other opportunities that it could be something not malicious. Um, so I think in this type of scenario, you really just take it slow if you can. You take a deep breath and evaluate all the options you have. Assume compromise. You are now working in a a sort of field of conflict. You measure out all the responses that you can take and you move smartly. Because if they're already in your network, they've already compromised you. It's time for you to respond thoroughly and thoughtfully. No, that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, both of us were on a, a, a call recently and we were, we were talking about the ability to control your landscape, right? And we're going to cover this in a moment, but ultimately you, it's your infrastructure that you own. So, I mean, it's exciting really about the things that you control. I mean, don't necessarily be nervous about the environment. So ultimately, as we go to the next slide here, it's about, you know, what's next? You know, you've, you've been compromised. You, you, you now have whatever the indication is to know that things aren't operating as they're supposed to be. And, and now you're to that next step. You're trying to figure out, well, how sophisticated is this? How far does this go? And what kind of tools can I use to really even be able to do a, a passive identification of what's happening, knowing that maybe the attacker has a rootkit in the environment, they've taken the time so that if you run any type of tools on a device like Netstat or local security audits or policies or anything, 
It may be an indication of the attacker that you're doing something, as well as those tools may just give you false information anyway and a false sense of security. So how can you start passively analyzing the environment to regain an understanding of what you have and the trustworthiness of what you have? And, um, you know, ultimately, you think getting to the point of bringing in the right personnel, you know, from inside your organization. Do you have a trusted peer network or you know, do you need to work through your your support agreements and contact integrators and vendors so that you can actually even get some kind of sophisticated um, debugging capability directly into a controller, possibly, because, of course, generally as an asset owner operator, you don't have access to those types of tools, and possibly even working with a government entity to help you. So there's a number of things, and I, I'm excited to hand it over here to Rob, where maybe you can even talk about you know, some of the tools that you can use on some of your host systems, as well as even managing some of the data sets you're going to be dealing with. Oh, absolutely. So this is where it gets exciting, uh, at least for me. I, there's nothing scarier than a compromise, especially as a control system network. And it's a bad situation to be in. There's nothing to be made light of that, especially when we're talking about safety systems and systems that impact people's lives. But when you get to the stage that you've thought out your process, you're getting ready to go, and hopefully you've already prepared prior to this, and we'll end we'll up talking about that in the third point, but you're ready to go, this is where you become the hunter. This gets exciting because now someone's coming to your house, your territory, and you have the tools and capabilities to respond to that. So this is where you get to whip out some of your industry-level tools and start looking. Now, some of the ones I would recommend, when you're dealing with IT networks, you are going to have to look at your IT networks at some point. Even if you think your compromise is only in the control system environment, it came from somewhere. Now, it could be a supply chain hack where uh, someone embedded something in your PLC or, or embedded something in one of your controllers, but most of that, that's very sophisticated. Most of the times, people are going to come in through your business network, through unsecured connections. And those Windows and Linux systems that you have have forensic tools and capabilities ready for them. So FTK and NCASE are two great tools to take digital images off of those computers. You basically capture that moment in time of what that computer looks like. You capture its hard drives, you capture its, you know, the physical data on it, but a really powerful thing is you capture its memory. So when you look at a memory on a computer, you've got everything running on it. And there are some advanced capabilities in terms of hiding rootkits or code in memory, but they stand out if you take just one look. You know, I, I teach quite a few students in this memory analysis field, um, and I love having up to the first day handing students a dump of memory and having taught them literally only for a couple hours, asking them, find the malware. And every student I've ever taught has found processes running, and they go, you know, this looks suspicious, this started up the wrong time, and this just is, this stands out, something's wrong. What piece of malware is this? Because here it is. And the malware was Stuxnet. And so we hear about Stuxnet being super advanced and capable and everything, and, and it was, and that's great and wonderful. But when you know your networks and when you're on the hunt, things are obvious. And so a memory dump analysis, it's obvious when there's something going on that's wrong. Um, and that's just a powerful tool to have. So how do you do that analysis of the memory? One of my favorite tools is volatility. It has a lot of plugins and everything already made and ready to go. It's got a massive community around it. You know, you can get Mandiant's Redline as well. It's another great tool. Personally, I, I just like using volatility. Um, but it's a bad idea to ever throw tools out of your arsenal. Just it's good to be well um, informed on specific tools, but keep all your options open. But so you're looking at volatility to pop, uh, do your uh, memory analysis. Maybe you've got Wireshark or TCP dump or you know, Snort on your network, so you're looking at the traffic analysis. Because again, if they're coming into your network, they're coming in and leaving. If there's a piece of malware, it's got to have some, some aspect of callback domain. It's calling back out outside your network to say, hey, look, I'm here. Uh, here's an unsecured connection you can now use. So you watch for that. And one of my favorite questions that came in was, what do I do when I have too much data? Like, how do I go through too much data? And what a great position to be in, to have too much data instead of too little. Um, so there's two main things I would say for this. One, digital friendly community in general has for quite a while now loved and respected the aspect of a timeline analysis. So if your uh, firewall or some original indication comes in on Tuesday that something's going on, and then a couple days later you notice some weird things going on your network, 
you can go back to Tuesday, you take all the digital pieces of evidence you have, those artifacts, you, you put them in some sort of timeline. There's some automated processes for this. Uh, one is log the timeline. And you just look at, you take a step back, and you look at the events, you go, man, you know, these, these connections are a little odd, these user accounts got created, you know, in this time frame, you start picking out things. And it gets pretty complex, but pretty easy to do, right? Um, none of none of this is just easy, but it can be exciting when you you now are on the hunt. And then I would also point out before I pass it back, Matt, that when you start talking about too much network data, that can be such an issue. You're talking gigabytes or terabytes of data that you have to store on a daily basis. So one of the, my suggestions is again going back to that understand your network. If you know certain connections between certain computers and certain types of traffic are good, you can whitelist those out. And so what this means for your collection capability is when you're doing TCP dump or Wireshark, you do capture filters. You can script out the data or put capture filters on it to say, look, I don't want to see this type of traffic. I don't want to see stuff that matches this profile because I've already evaluated that as being good. And then everything else is a smaller pool of data to look for. So if you're not taking advantage of your network in terms of handling that too much data, you are losing your number one defense tool. When I had my consulting company, as we would go into a facility, uh, you know, one of the things that we would use in an identification how sophisticated the cybersecurity program was, was really just how does your incident response plan look like? You know, what, what does it look like? And seeing, does somebody have authority to respond? Who are the right people that you have as far as your contact list? And do you have an analysis of skills of who you're bringing in for certain capabilities? What are the resources that you're going to manage or, or go look at? Where do you have your logs? Where do you have this too much data? What are you analyzing? You know, and it's, it's fantastic that, you know, and I can only hope that everybody, you know, watching this web webinar has the ability and authority to start really defining your instant response plan so that you can know what kind of capabilities you already have. And hopefully you have the opportunity to really take the time, as Rob's stating and we're ta discussing, to know your, know your network, know who, how things are talking to each other, who talks to who, uh, and then even go one level deeper than that where you can even know functionally whether somebody is doing, you know, or, or systems are supposed to be doing read or write to coils and contacts and, and control capabilities and even profiling your Modbus, DMP3, ICCP data flows, whatever it may be where you truly know how things interact with each other. Because ultimately, you know, the, the attacking entity initially, they, they have none of that. Um, and even as time goes on, you're able to make changes to your environment, hopefully documented, hopefully through some kind of change control system, that you're able to reflect upon and have a baseline. So that gets into the next slide here of really trying to have some mechanism to validate the trustworthiness of of your cyber assets and even of your physical assets, how they're being manipulated, controlled, and sensed. You know, and furthermore, your personnel. I mean, the, the reality is, if you've sensed something, I, you know, it, it is painful, but it even could be an internal threat actor. I've, I've lived that, right? I even lived in a situation where the person was the chief security officer that was doing the bad events in the in the organization, and that's incredibly harmful. You hope that that's not the case in the situation, but you just don't know. So you're now at the point that you have to have some kind of trustworthiness validation and and even understanding, you know, where, where again, was this first sensed? Uh, where did you get the indication that something was happening? So, but it may be further than that. Maybe you can go back and use people as your intrusion detection sensors. I mean, who is better? I mean, that's, that's the best resource ultimately that you have uh, it's your personnel and being able to sense odd behavior. Uh, from a consulting capacity, as we went into organizations, it was quite obvious that the personnel actually knew a number of the vulnerabilities. They, they, they knew it. They understood them. Um, and, and that was an incredible value. But once something has been indicated, now you can go back and start looking forensically just by figuring out, hey, did anybody receive any strange emails, have any odd system behavior, phone calls, were there any control operation changes, what happened? Uh, even furthermore, trying to understand, is there phys anything physically that was left behind? When we get into physical cyber attacks, 
if you were to look at Stuxnet, as we brought up earlier, and if Natanz was designed as it was, well, then it was air-gapped, and most likely there had to be some kind of a physical cyber intrusion that took place. It was a couple of years ago where I devised the, the modified PLC cable and showed that, that is an opportunity of an, a part of an attack surface. So the same thing holds true here. Could it be more sophisticated? It doesn't necessarily be fully sophisticated either. That was just in the tens of dollars of an attack. But understanding even physical facility inspections and, and working with and having the right people as part of your team of response for physical, cyber, operational uh, response capabilities. Reviewing your system baselines and your device firmware and your logic and operational logs. There's just a number of things that you want to and hopefully have at your disposal. Uh, ultimately, again, that's the point. If you don't have these capabilities at your disposal now and you're not believed to be compromised, create them. Figure out a way to produce them. So uh, I'd love to hand it over to Rob here to see uh, some of his thoughts around this. Yeah, so uh, when you're talking about the review of the system baseline, I think that's really, really good. Um, in the digital forensics community and, and more for the security community in general, we have digital hashes, which are in the basic sense, a short mathematical representation of data. So you can have you know, 10 terabytes of data and take a 128-bit key or byte key of, um, that represents that data. And you know when you look at it again, if the hash hasn't changed, that that data hasn't changed. So I think this is really important that you understand those baselines. And you know, how many can honestly say, listen in the webinar, that you know or you have a digital hash of your backup logic for a controller. And so maybe your controller gets compromised and you go to re-image or you upload your new logic um, from the backup you created. How do you know that backup has actually not been compromised as well? If I was an attacker on a network, it's one of the first things I would do is compromise the backups. Heck, even if I didn't make it to the controllers, eventually when you do back them up or when you do reload that backup on there, you're going to infect them yourself. So, Understand that baseline. Using forensic tools and security tools like digital hashing, something very basic, is very important. Um, I really love the topic of, of review your operational logs. So we consider firewall logs to be forensic and security evidence. We consider intrusion detection systems to be like this. But what about historian logs? You know, Matt, you, you brought up this topic of commands being sent that look a little odd, and I think that's a perfect scenario. You and, you have someone reading coils to try to understand, you know, what's going on in this PLC, what's going on in this environment, on this RTU. That's a piece of evidence that is useful to you because an attacker is going to have to do that if they really want to understand the network. So those historians are great forensics uh, piece of evidence. And, and I think this is something Matt, you and I have been working on and to look at what are some of the things in the community that we can do research on. And at the very end, we're going to pitch a few ideas to those well-intentioned and very um, professional and capable people out there on, on what tools we do need developed. But I, I would go ahead and touch specifically on historian and, and, and being able to develop the tools to really take advantage of the things that are already on your network. Sometimes you don't need to buy these thousands of dollars or multi-million dollar solutions uh, for security. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you can just take advantage of what's already on your network. Um, so. I would really point to that as a trustworthiness and validation type statement. And again, do you really even have the capabilities in-house? Uh, at some point, you raise the flag and you go, you know what, I, I need other people. I need help. And there's nothing wrong in that. I would actually hate to work on a team where you get so stubborn that you just, you just have to solve it yourself. There's some pride in that, but especially in control system environments, you really are talking about monetary impact in people's lives, or what's worse is literally people's lives in terms of safety. You're talking about nuclear power and water or oil. You're talking about safety of human life, and pride has to take a step to the side. No, that's an excellent point, <clears throat> and it just makes me think that, I mean, the reality is we are somewhat in a cyber arms race right now, so you know, what is the sophistication of the attacker? And as time continues, it, it's not necessarily going to be a nation state that may perform these activities. It could be somebody much less sophisticated, as we were saying earlier. Again, knowing that, uh, as Rob was mentioning, around knowing that the, the hackers even have management and bosses and, and requirements that they have to meet. But ultimately, uh, 
you control, at least you should be able to control your infrastructure and how it's designed and, and what's in place. And, and that's where there's another fantastic opportunity getting into really how do you prepare for this type of situation? You know, how do you prepare up front? Again, with the hope that right now as you're going through this webinar that you're not actively compromised. And, and if you are, you know what, then maybe we, uh, re reach out to Rob and I and we'll even, you know, we absolutely would be there to help you as long as, of course, your management supports that decision. But uh, prior to that, how do you, you know, what, what do you do? Do you have the capability to enable some kind of tools for monitoring your traffic? Do you have the ability to even your current support agreement through your integrator or a vendor that supplied your control environment to even set up a tap port, a spam port, intrusion detection or monitoring or uh, additional um, firewall rules or capability? What are you able to do? Um, I am excited to say that um, we're going to be, you know, and Rob alluded to this, we're going to be actually generating a, some research, and sadly, it is labeled right now as, as research, even though you act, truly have an active environment that you're dealing with at this point in time. But research around the current industrial switches that are in place, most likely at your facility, I'm not going to name names of the vendors, but there's a number of them. We're going to include five of the major ones. And analyzing the ability to set up tapping ports, span ports, mirror ports, and is it going to have an impact on your scan rates, any of your control signaling? And, and we're going to go through a methodology to try to provide assurances that you can now include this capability in your infrastructure without impacting your operations. And, and that's really the role that you need to start playing. Is, it's not just thinking about what you have as an operational capability, and hopefully your management will support this, but also even really thinking about what kind of tools do you need to become an active defender? Um, not an active offender, I mean defender. You want to try to figure out what kind of controls that you need to have to really, I mean, let's just go back to medieval warfare, right? You, you want to be able to have an oversight of your position. You spend the time to have turrets in a castle so you can be above your assailant. You build your moat that's in place that it is up to you and at your luxury to allow somebody to cross the moat at a given time by having the drawbridge being open or closed. Hopefully you have that capability within your infrastructure to, to, to go back, to say, you know what, there are some automated procedures that we can really still perform manually. We can, we can go back and have shelter in our environment, no different than, right, I'm a Midwestern background and a tornado warning comes out, you seek shelter, right? You have a, a way where you can still live and survive and maintain who you are as a person, right? The life continuity plan. Well, do you have an industrial continuity plan and what you want to do to maintain your operations while you're under siege? You know, and, and hopefully you've, you have the ability to design and change and alter what you have in your infrastructure so that you're prepared to respond if you start having this indication that, you may have been compromised. And that includes even creating these choke points or limited data flows or, again, completely severing connectivity. So I, I again, want to hand it over to Rob to get some input, his input on this. Yeah, I mean, those are all really good points. And, and I know I've hammered on this real big need to understand and know your network. But sometimes, it's, again, it's just not feasible. So I think the most powerful point on this slide is the, the aspect of questions to ask to determine your readiness. You just have to ask yourself in an honest and open way, if I was compromised right now, would I know where to begin? And if the answer is no, you've got work to do. You just you can't wait around. So there may be purpose in being thoughtful and thorough and taking a deep breath before you start, but not purpose and not being ready at all. And this is the thing that wraps up with forensics teams all the time. I don't know how many times I've been a part of or heard from a number of other people in the community how frustrating it is to arrive on site and a forensic investigation team has been called in, uh, you're on the team, and a compromise has occurred, and you ask the asset owners, you ask the people, hey, what are your critical information systems? What are the things that we have to ensure are most important to you? And what does your network look like? 
and usually it's a two to three day, get, I'll get back to you later type scenario. That's a lot of time lost, a lot of critical time lost. And now the asset owner or the facility owners are paying a much larger bill than they needed to. But when a forensics team, whether it's in-house or outside, can come in and you already have ready for them network diagrams or at least identifying what is critical to you, you're a step ahead of the game. So if you can ask yourself that and honestly answer if you're ready or not, that is a, a big intrinsic look that is very important in this process. And so if you're trying to do this in-house and you're trying to secure this data and set up those choke points and, you know, hey, Matt and Rob, where do I, where do I put those draw bridges around my castle? You know, you can't necessarily look at a thousand network node, uh, a thousand nodes in your network and just do a blanket across that. Sometimes the easiest way to get started is, again, identifying those critical pieces of your network, those critical uh, systems that hold the data, and validating those, setting up the perimeter around that, and moving your perimeter outward as you can build sort of a, a network diagram or an, more or less a whitelist of what should be on your network. And as you move those perimeters out, you can really do defense and a lot of times defense in depth very well. So you get started on what's most important to you. The attacker is not going to know what systems he or she has to hit to be most damaging to you. But I guarantee you, if you're a good engineer or operator and you've been in that network for a while, you know what you would hate to have happen the most. You know those systems that you just dread if they went down. Maybe it's the safety system, you know, with a, the release of the cooling water onto reactor. Like, you, you know what you really want to protect. So focus there first and start moving out. This Defense in depth discussion as well. It always sort of makes me laugh in the control system community when people will be like, "Oh yeah, you should you should put locks on your door and a fence around your house." Well, that's, that's smart and that's good. And you know, you want to make sure you you focus on those doors and windows of your house, those choke points. But one of the things that I normally laugh about is sometimes we don't even know where our house is. Sometimes we don't even know where our neighborhood is. If you want to do that analogy, we're really bad about identifying the assets we really care about. We're big on critical infrastructure, but we're pretty bad usually about identifying our own critical assets. So if you can do that, you can start preparing today, and you can make it a lot easier and a lot smoother transition if you need to call in outside help. You know, I, I, of course, we know at the end of the day, I mean, this webinar is one part, and now hopefully, you know, it's how do you go back to management, or if you are management, how, again, do you get approval of funds to start making changes, and what kind of infrastructure you need to have in place, or how do you just currently use the tools that you already have, as we had discussed? It, it takes time. It takes understanding. It takes commitment to communication to the rest of your team. Uh, this is not, as Rob brought up earlier, this isn't an individual issue. One person can solve this. And, and ultimately, you know, myself, you know, personally, and also the team that I had as we had the consultancy, you, you almost, you have to express ignorancy. I mean, it's, you look at it and say, all right, I, we need to go and figure this out, and there's areas that I don't understand, and let's work together collectively, engineering, operations, IT, physical security, to figure out how we're going to prepare for this type of situation and what we're going to do when we need to respond and what kind of tools we need to have accessible to us to not only protect our environment and controls, but knowing what we're going to do if we detect something. Because ultimately, I went back and I said, I was talking about instant response and looking at the sophistication of the instant response plan to figure out how well ingrained cybersecurity is. Uh, another big component, I mean, security doesn't exist without a sufficient response plan. Uh, it doesn't. So you have your controls and then you see something and now you have to go and respond to it at that point in time. And then you have lessons learned that come out of it as far as some changes you need to make. Uh, and then with control environments, of course, you really are intentional about being able to respond in an appropriate time frame before we have any loss of life scenarios, before we have any massive casualties or challenges we're going to run into. So that said, we, we absolutely do have a, an enormous amount of, of work that needs to be done in really providing tools to the industry to, to have better visibility in, in, in what you have. Now, knowing just a key piece of, of understanding what your systems are and how they communicate with, the, with each other, that's that's an amazing leverage point. But add to that, let's say if we can map tools like volatility into a PLC, a PAC, an RTU, another embedded device, 
could vendors start exposing their debugging capabilities directly into a controller so you can just see what's happening in these devices. Of course, during a known good time, and then you can even analyze it during a known bad where you believe you're compromised and see how far the attack uh, has gone into the environment. So that said, there are so many questions that came in that were fantastic. We don't have uh, you know, an endless amount of time, neither do you. We understand that. Uh, hopefully we've given you some good ideas or discussion points or things that you can use back in your team or some action items that you can do over the next three months, six months to a year, whatever your time frame is, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, there absolutely are going to be follow-on discussions available at uh, dragosecurity.com. And taking the time, of course, through control engineering, we'll be working uh, to produce additional content with them as well. So. Uh, we appreciate your time, and hopefully this has been valuable for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt and Robert. That was a great presentation. Within a few days, this presentation will be available for on-demand viewing. We'll post the archive on the Control Engineering website, and we will send you an email message with a link connecting directly to it after it is ready. Any questions that you ask during the broadcast will be forwarded to the presenters and we will use them to create an online discussion forum, so watch for that. Thanks again to our great speakers, Matt Llewellyn and Robert Lee, for sharing their time and expertise. But now that we're just about done, we want to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it as we use this information to improve our webcast. So on behalf of CFE Media and Control Engineering, Thanks for attending this webcast. Copyright 2013, CFE Media. Thank you.